question is, how big is light? I mean, how much light is there on Earth? How much do we know about it? How hard would it be to preserve the deep genetic diversity of all major living of life on Earth? Is it feasible? And then just a few comments about how rapidly the science of genomics is changing from the point of view of natural history and, uh, and biodiversity science. So, and I think all of you probably know this diagram. It's the, it's the one that Darwin did in his notebooks when he was on the uh, voyage of the Beagle. It's when he first starts to think in trees. Tree thinking is fundamental to everything that we're going to be talking about today. 1837, it's so famous that graduate students at Harvard actually get tattoos <laughs> uh, like that. And this is, this is actually a fairly small tree. We're now up to 120,000 terminals. It's not unreasonable to expect in the tree of life. So you might say that we have enough knowledge of the phylogeny of life to accurately plan how to preserve it. We know enough about it. Um, another sort of scientific comparison, Linnaeus starts in 1758. All genera are natural. Linnaeus is reaching for the notion of what a natural taxon is. He's understanding that there must be some deep meaning for why all oak trees look like oak trees, all minnows look like minnows. Then in 1953, Watson and Crick say it has not escaped our notice, and they discovered the structure of DNA. It's 1953. 1837, 1758, 1837, 1953, 1972, 2017. The world has changed really quick. Um, what, what has really happened to our science, say, in the last, uh, since, say, 1998? One of the things that's happened is that our ability to sequence DNA uh, has come down dramatically in price. This is Moore's Law, which is the one about transistors and uh, computer chips. The, actually, the, the cost of the human genome in today's dollars is about $4 billion. Uh, now, the human genomes are doable at less than $1,000. This is, uh, if you take eukaryotic genomes since 1998, uh, we're up to about 1,000 fungi, um, something like a hundred um, animals. So the pace at which genomic science is sequencing biodiversity is increasing at a really dramatic exponential rate. Uh, and note that this, this thing here, which makes it short of linear, is a logarithmic scale. So obviously, as scientists, we're faced with both the disappearance of biodiversity and also this, this sort of revolution in our science that enables us to learn more about things by sequencing their genomes. What else has happened here is that in 1995, this is the, the taxa in GenBank. When you look up at 1995, about 80% of all the taxa that were ever had any sequences entered into GenBank had a Latin name. Now, uh, only about 27%. So in other words, Genomics is sequencing species and lineages faster than we can put names on it. The only way to get a name on, on, a, on a sequence is by giving the voucher specimen to someone like us and saying, what is it? Right? So our ability to do this, taxonomists are dwindling. Uh, there's not enough people left on Earth to identify things that are being sequenced at the rate of speed that they're being sequenced. Uh, for example, I work on spiders. About 58% of all the spiders on GenBank are just spiders. Uh, so this leads me to think that what, what we might do is use the tree of life in order to produce sort of practical mesoscale IDs, by which I mean identifications to the genus or the family level. And what happens if you start doing things like that? Oh, this is a, these are the eukaryotic genomes that are in um, GenBank right now. Uh, this, is a, this is not actually a sort of a numerical score, but what it means is that uh, there's a thing called the N50, which is, you know that when you get reads and you assemble them, they're put into contings, so you might get 150 base pair of reads out of an aluminum sheet, and then you put them together to make the most, the largest pieces of contiguous DNA you can, and then those things you assemble into uh, <coughs> scaffolds. And so, 
the the mo the one that is the the most the best done actually is a species of uh, it's Edie tajipti, one of the uh, the vector that you see for that matter. And so it has 10 to the 7 kilobases of sequence and 10 to the 8 of scaffolding. So people are getting out enormous continuous reads of DNA. So it's not, it's not the problem, the computational problem that it was even a year ago. So now let's, let's put this in context of other kinds of big data that the planet is doing. Uh, natural history collections, roughly uh, a billion Roughly, you know, about three billion specimens. GenBank is in the 10 to the 16. The Global Biodiversity Information Facility, which uh, has all the locations of organisms on Earth and names, about billions there. Biodiversity Heritage Library, an attempt to to OCR to optically character to scan all the all the taxonomic literature on Earth, about 10 to the 10th words. Um, all the way down to something else I'm going to talk about here, which is uh, our effort to build a global database of tissues and where they are, because that's what's regulating in genomics. So what are the goals of this program that we're running, GGI? Um, at the moment, if you just take the question of tissues, it's hard to know who has tissues of what taxon on Earth. If you want a particular frog, you need to know who works on frogs, and you need to email them and find out if they have a tissue. They're also ambiguous quality and they're ambiguously owned. It's not clear whether they're owned by an institution, like a museum like this, or whether they're owned by an individual PI. What we want afterwards is publicly accessible genome quality tissues in enterprise level biorepositories. Bio that means that are, that are owned and operated by institutions that have sort of historical permanence, following best practices and international treaties. The organization with which we're seeking to think is completely crazy. Basically, we've been doing model organisms up until now, or something that somebody just happens to want to do, like, say, all the plasmodium, <coughs> versus a phylogenetic approach where you would have an affordable, coordinated sequencing <coughs> of a synopsis of all of life. And what does it do to IDs? Right now, we're doing phenotype-based, expert-limited taxonomy. That's pretty much how you get names, still, after 300 years. Uh, that also limits environmental biology, it limits uh, environmental monitoring, it limits our ability to scale with big data and evolution and conservation and anything else. And we might be able to get the taxonomic idea of most organisms anywhere with uh, a particular approach to sequencing. So what do we want to do by the year 2020? It turns out there are, I'll show this more in detail later on, but there's about only about 10,000 families of life on Earth. That's everything from bacteria to humans. Just 10,000, which, when you think about it, is, is an amazing thing. Well, then the rest of these things, I think, is sort of obvious. We want to synergize research. We want, this is reinventing museums in the 21st century, right? To heck with colonial approaches. We want international peer-to-peer -peer relationships between institutions. We want to be able to do an approximate idea of any organism anywhere on Earth by an untrained expert. We want global biorepositories. We want genome samples. And then we also have to educate the public to understand uh, the importance of genomics and the importance of biodiversity. So how big is life? Uh, this is the usual graph you see just for four groups, bees, mammals, birds, and spiders. It's from approximately the beginning of Linnaeus through 2010, which is the last time I compiled the data. And um, what I mean by this discovery is someone goes out in the woods and they pick up an organism and they look at it and say, that's a new species. It's not, this is not taxonomic churning and splitting and lumping and synonymizing and bringing back out a synonym and playing with nomenclature. This is actual discovery of life on Earth. And as you might expect, birds are asymptotic. About, uh, in other words, about 100% of birds have been described. Um, something like spiders, there's about 45,000 species of spiders, are on the other hand sort of still going up. Mammals and birds are sort of in between. So that's the depressing slide you usually see. It says, oh, there's too many species of life on Earth. There's 1.9 million described, there's 15 out there. We can never get it done. But if you use phylogenetics to go a little bit deeper in the tree, 
and you start looking at families. Families means a monophyletic group that is accorded the Linnaean rank of family. So I know that families aren't comparable across all of life, but this is the best tool we have to address this problem right now. And what you notice is that almost everything is asymptotic. The, the actual discovery in nature of a new family of life on Earth happens perhaps five to 10 times a year. It's almost never done. And if it is done, it's usually because of some funny habitat somewhere. Whereas, of course, bacteria and archaea, because we only recently learned how to study those, are still in the asymptotic phase for family level groups. So first thing about this project is the feasibility talking about the phylogenetic structure of life. So as I said, there is roughly, it depends on who you ask, but there's somewhere 8,000, 9,000, 10,000 families of life on Earth. There's about 149,000 genera described. Nobody has a list of all the genera of life on Earth. It's never been compiled. Uh, species is perhaps 15,000, but we know that 90% of the species on Earth are undescribed, right? So they don't have names. So there's no way you can hand an undescribed species to a taxonomist and get a species level name unless they formally describe it. So the whole idea of having a, you know, a gen bank record of the species level is kind of crazy because we know 90% of them don't have names. Whereas genera and families, we know. It's, it's kind of rare to bring an organism to the right taxonomist and not have been able to tell you what family Families we can do. So this is just some illustrations of when the last time families of life were discovered. In, uh, in flowering plants, it was 1972. In uh, mammals, it was 1974. Uh, in, in birds, it was 1903. Spiders a relatively poorly known group, 2012. And I'm being hosted largely by the etiology department, so this is uh, 2012. Someone goes to what I think was a cave or something off the Philippines, and they pull out this, this uh, I think it's an eel, isn't it? Yeah, it's a kind of eel, right? And they say, that's different. So it really doesn't happen very often. Um, which is to say that to that level of approximation, our community actually understands life on Earth. There's not a whole lot left to do at the family level, apparently. That's not to say that you, know, you can't sequence something and decide that, oh, it's got to be two families. Those two things will still have been discovered by, say, 1938. That animal or plant will have been collected. It's, this is the, the wave of discovery passing through the diversity of life on Earth. And I would argue that we we're pretty much done at the family level. We'll never be done at the species level because we're going to lose it. So the interesting tension is sort of at the genus level, the, the clay of life on Earth that contain about 10 species each. So what GGI has done then is to take all of these systems of big data, like uh, GenBank, Open Tree of Life is a phylogeny project. GBIF is where things live. Um, Encyclopedia of Life is one page per every species. That's do you know what it looks like? Do you know anything about it? And we put it all into uh, one large database, which is on the GGI Knowledge Portal, which is this thing right here, which you can go and see. And for example, if you go there to this website and you pick up something like oaks, that ACE, what you see is that uh, the total number of pages in the Biodiversity Heritage Library that have the word oaks in them, or Fagaceae actually, is about somewhere around 67,000. So we've got 67,000 pages of scanned literature on that. In bold, which is the which is a database of barcodes, there's 756, the UO is 208. And what we did was we, we took these things and we turned them into percentiles, like your kid getting ranked in, in college, right, you're in the 99th percentile. That means within families of life on Earth, if you have a score like this, you're in the 100th percentile, which means we know a lot about that particular family. So if you look across all of life, 
all the five families of life for these various sources of big data. For example, GBIF, the, uh, the group with the maximum number of locality records is ducks, anatomy. That's because people like looking at ducks, and they keep putting in a lot longer where they saw the duck. Um, NCBI, about 39,000. The interesting thing, though, is over here, this is the number of families of life on Earth that taxonomists know to exist that have no records of biodiversity, heraclitis, no, no barcodes, no EOL, no localities, no tissues, almost all, no, no sequences. So um, we're sort of in the middle. You know, there's an awful lot of families of life on Earth that we know about that none of these people have ever seen before. So that's, that's sort of the gap that we want to fill. Um, if you take uh, these data items per family, this is just to sort of show you how, and you just do it for the 89 phyla, there's roughly 90 phyla or divisions of life on Earth, and you look at it, you see that arthropods and chordates are very well known. Micronathazole, which might be in the Yeah, uh, the best known families are these. Asteraceae, five families of flowering plants. Um, Asteraceae are composites, daisies, grasses, beans, <coughs> roses, and congratulations to ichthyology, cyprinids. Why is cyprinids um, ranking so high? Don't know. At least I don't know. Why? Yeah. Right. So the least known is this new phylum of life that was discovered in 1994. Uh, Micronapha has a very complex jaw structure. Um, it has only two data points, one web page in EOL and one in GBIF. So um, this is really cool. We can take all of life, parse it into 10,000 things, and sort of machine reason across all of it to say, uh, what do we know? What do we need to do next? Um, if you take these things, this GGI score, which is um, what percentile ranking is it across all families of life on Earth? Knowledge is things like uh, Biodiversity Heritage Library, um, EOL, things like that. Genomics is NCBI and old. Geography is GBIF. Across all these families of life, you can kind of see where the phyla of life on Earth and how they fit into the global amount of knowledge that we have. So that's how big life is. Now, how feasible is it? Well, if you look at a little place like the island of Morea, which is just off the coast of Tahiti and the middle of the Pacific Ocean, the Smithsonian and the Moore Foundation University of Berkeley decided to inventory all species on that island. And we picked that one because there were so few species. It's way out in the middle of nowhere. And although the marine diversity is, is even the marine diversity is very good, but 74% of the marine phyla are present around the island of Moray. 23% of all marine families are present around the island of Moray. Which is to say, you can go to one place on Earth and get a huge percentage of the total play brand for diversity of life. Particularly if you're willing to go up to sort of deeper and larger nodes. <clears throat> and climate, by the way, the species level. This is uh, the forest geoplot that uh, we coordinate with a big international consortia. What they do is, this is the 50 hectare plots. You've got probably 10 of them in Brazil. They started on uh, Barrow, Colorado, in Panama, 50 hectares. Every stem above the size of my thumb is individually georeferenced and measured and then census every five years. So uh, there are more than 40 now, but back when there were 40, they had about 11,000 species of trees. That's about 4,300 genera. That's about 60% of the world total of tree species, and certainly of genera, is we know exactly where that organism is living. All we have to do is go out there and catch it. So, I'm suggesting, in other words, that we, re we recollect the planet in a phylogenetically structured way to uh, enable the kind of non-critical knowledge we need, gained mainly through genomics, to answer important questions. 
Now, um, the reason I'm down here is because we are doing a uh, workshop tomorrow and the next day, Biodiversidade Biobanque e Brasil. So it's, a, it's something that PESPI is organizing to get leaders in genomics and biobanking across Brazil to come together to talk about a national strategy for uh, freezer farms or tank farms in Brazil. And there's, according to GBIF, there's about 3,000 families of life on Earth that occur inside Brazil. There's about 1,600 of them that are on no known tissues anywhere. They're sort of still out there in the wild in terms of genome quality tissues. And this is by state. Um, how many families, for example, on Amazonas <coughs> would be new to this database of tissues? So I'm hoping to sell the, the Sao Paulo government, the PESTI, on the idea of strategically funding the collection and preservation of genomic diversity in Brazil through the construction of biobanks in Brazil, which were the main property of Brazil, of course. So the thing to notice here is that, of course, most of the families in Mondonia are the same families in Mato Grosso, so it's not like you map all these numbers up and that's what they're all unique, right? Many of those families occur in most of the states of Brazil, but it just shows you uh, on a state-by-state -state basis where you can go. If you do that for genera, <coughs> there's about 15,000 genera, uh, we think, I think, maybe, in Brazil. That's everything, soup to nuts, about and about 11,000 of those are new to GPN, so it's the same sort of numbers. Uh, these are contributions that um, probably at the genus level that Brazil can uniquely make to the world collection of genome quality tissues and the preservation of, of genomic diversity. So I think it's worth doing. Um, now about that claim about the approximate identification of any organism anywhere on Earth, that's by an untrained person. So a nine-year-old can pick up a bug, stick it in their tricorder, and in, say, two days, find out maybe what genus it is. Does that actually work? We did this, this study on uh, a collection of <coughs> CO1 barcodes, 654 base pairs of the Cybermon is <coughs> one gene, uh, downloaded from GenBank or contributed by us in a new study. So there was 821 species in that database that we thought were accurately identified by specialists around the world. And we took each one of those, the sequences we had, and we blasted it against our database of sequences. So it always looks <coughs> something right with 100% accuracy. But the question is, of the other things that it did, uh, how well did it do? And it turns out that 91% are correct at the family level. So, in other words, if you go out anywhere in Europe, pick up a spider, pull off a leg, do a CO1 sequence, you'll get 91% of the time you'll get the right family. And 85% of the time you'll get the right genus. So, and this is for, this is a statistic in gen that measures um, how good the match is, how good the blast is. It's, we only take things that are 95% or above. So we throw out all the ones that are lower than that. So that, that's one tiny little proof of concept that you could enable citizens, citizen science, to identify things. And once they know what it is, they are really empowered to care about it and do something about it. As well as, of course, it would be useful for us because then we wouldn't get like all these endless requests from ecologists to identify their 4,000 vouchers from um, studying the litter or whatever. Uh, we can, we can you know, focus on doing systematics. And the identification of things becomes automated and scalable. So um, laboratories, and this is just a picture from the Smithsonian. We have a laboratory of analytical biology. We also have, uh, courtesy of our federal government, built a biorepository with 24 liquid nitrogen tanks and 54 freezers, having about a 4 to 5 million 2 millimeter cryo tube capacity. And there's only 1.9 million species described. So you don't have to build out at this level. That's just sort of a Smithsonian went nuts building this giant facility. But you can start with one tank or a couple of freezers and um, really sort of begin to contribute to this global effort. 
Now, the other thing you have to do. Oh, I think I'm missing a slide. I am missing a slide. There was a slide in here about um, the quality of DNA. And when you look up here at the top, that's a that's a gel of DNA. It's the These things, this is high quality DNA. It's DNA that whose fragments are so large that in an agarose gel, no amount of electricity will make those fragments go down in the gel. They're stuck at the top because they're like 20,000 base pairs. And then you take um, this image J, which is open source, and you do all this stuff. And basically what we're suggesting is that genome quality tissue are fragments that are better than, say, 10,000 base pairs, which for our community would be a reach because mostly what we do now is we go out and we get tissues and we put it in 95% ethanol and we leave it on the dashboard of our truck for two weeks and then we bring it in the office and finally makes it into the freezer. So we can improve our collecting technique to try to get the genome quality tissues that science now needs in order, in order to do this kind of stuff. Um, now, in order to do all of this, GDI and when was it, 2011? Uh, organized a workshop uh, because the first thing you need to do is have a data structure so that you can machine reason across tissue samples. And you may know that we, we do have uh, Darwin Core Archive, which is the very few data fields that we use to, just, to reason across the names of species, where they occur, when they were collected, who collected them, stuff like that. What's never existed until now is a set of standardized terms to describe DNAs, RNAs, tissues, and batons. So um, colleagues of ours in Germany sort of started this off, and uh, now this thing has grown to be uh, 66 members in 22 countries. There's 650,000 samples, which is not a lot, but considering it's grown 400% in the last year, it's getting there. About 3,000 families, 18,000 genera, about 55,000 species in our sandbox. So um, we're making pretty good progress on this. <clears throat> we actually have, somebody went out and got a tissue and it's frozen. So uh, in Brazil, we have two partners. Those dots are in the right, well, not in the right place, are they? Maybe they are. One's in, one's in Rio, one's in Campinas. And we're hoping that more Brazilian institutions will sort of join up to do this. Um, these are all the, all the acronyms of the people who've done it. So um, <laughs> this is a global partnership to conserve tissues of life on Earth. Um, finally, this bit about de novo genomics. Um, about 10 years ago, we started a project to sort of describe to you how difficult it is to do, or was to do genomics projects. This is I5 tape, 5,000 arthropod genomes. It had a couple of arachnids in there. I was particularly involved in the one in the upper left. Um, and I don't know that this, uh, you guys are, many people in the audience are sort of familiar with all the stats and the, and the special verbiage that describes the genomic things, but this is how we plan to do it. 150 base pair inserts, um, 40 X coverage, um, et cetera, all paths. We, we sort of pushed this through a, uh, a bioinformatics pipeline in Texas, that's what those servers are doing over there. And um, this is the way the thing turned out. A third of all those projects died because we couldn't assemble the data. We could sequence it. We could get a trillion reads, 150 base pairs long, but we couldn't put that in a computer and put it together into long, contiguous pieces of DNA. And notice that the spiders are really sort of not doing very well. If you don't have, this is a contig N50. If you don't have one that is above 10,000, it's unpublishable. So most of these projects failed because we didn't have the informatics to do it. Uh, this is just some ideas about uh, where those things go. This is the, uh, the NG50 versus genome size. This is the gene number. All animals seem to have about 20 to 30,000 genes. Um, I think I might have just one more slide. Um, this is also what's going on now. Is, I don't know if you guys have heard about Oxford Nanopore uh, genomic sequencers. 
This is the Oxford nanopore sequencer. It's the size of a USB drive. It plugs into the USB port of your computer, and it reads out data continuously. So you can stop whenever you feel like it. If you only want, say, uh, a terabyte of data, you can stop in two days. So this is the old way of doing it. That's an API Sanger sequencing box. Almost nobody's using those any longer. There's, this is a fairly expensive way to do it, but it's just to say that the, the technology for doing this kind of sequencing is, is advancing rapidly, and, and it doesn't cost much. These things are about uh, $1,500 a piece. So um, we've also been testing new technologies to sort of uh, try to get around that assembly problem where we can't put pieces of DNA together in uh, contiguous pieces. Uh, this is dovetail genomics, and what it does is it takes, this is the fatal genome of the parasitota, the house spider, and if you send it to dovetail genomics, which is using sort of an optical method for, and chromatin-based method for figuring out contiguity in the genome, you get about uh, a tenfold increase in the quality of the genome. So not only is it the actual sequencing technology, but also the informatics and some other tricks like this are making uh, genomes much easier to come up with. So I don't think I'll say a tenfold improvement. That's just more numbers. And that's it. Thank you. Concern about the taxonomic bottleneck that you alluded to in the beginning of your talk. <laughs> that yeah. there are not enough specialists to actually put names on these things. So is there any branch of the project that's gonna emphasize? Yeah, I mean this is a, this whole global genome initiative is uh, from my point of view, as a hard shell comparative morphologist, is a Trojan horse. That was the thing that the who was like the Greeks ran into Troy with a hollow horse. This is a Trojan horse to recollect the planet. Uh, in other words, go out there with our specialist knowledge, get uh, voucher quality specimens, which are com completely rigorously collected and documented, plus the tissues. And it's the, it's the need for the tissues that will drive that. So, um, you know, at the family level, is, is that that hard to do? I don't think so. Um, the genus level gets a little bit harder. But um, this is also, I think, a kind of a cash cow. And I think all of you know from reading the newspapers, the amount of money that's flowing into genomics is just enormous. And uh, this is, I think, a way for our community to um, cash in. I was referring more to the dwindling number of taxonomists. Is there yeah. any provision for <clears throat> diverting some of the resources for actually uh, getting new people into the field? And well, it's, you know, Mario, the problem is finding permanent good jobs for people. So, I mean, the, the, I would say that the systematic community is front loading the way it does training so that there's, there are armies of, of you know, graduate students small armies of postdocs and almost nobody that gets a permanent job. That last thing is really hard to do, but uh, we certainly are funding graduate students and postdocs to do exactly this. Uh, 144 projects we've funded so far, 
given away about what four million dollars something like that. Um, so and a number of those are actually happening in Brazil. So we are funding people. I just can't give them lifetime jobs. Wish I could. Yeah, see, no, Bob. <coughs> a lot of empty way in there. After 2020, do you have plans to go to species levels? Or? Yes. Um, <coughs> but you need excellence. It's crazy, right? The species level is like undoable. But yeah, there is a there is a project that was announced in the page of Science Magazine called the Earth Biogenome Project, which is to sequence every species of life on Earth, which means a name. Um, that's uh, and it's not that much money. It's about four billion dollars is what they think. Um, so I think at this point it's. Right today, it's sort of still in the range of like the moonshot, you know. But uh, this is this is accelerating very, very rapidly. Um, all orders of birds are done. Um, Eric Jarvis at Rockefeller University has the funding to do one species of every order of vertebrates. Um, there is a lot of people who want to do this. So all species. Actually.